Hi, this is Brandon Christian here on the day of the great debate between Brother Jed Smock and myself. The topic tonight is going to be one of can one be consistently moral without believing in God? I will be arguing the affirmative, of course, as an atheist activist, and Brother Jed Smock will be taking the negative, arguing that one cannot be consistently moral without belief in God. We're looking forward to hopefully a good turnout, an interesting topic of conversation, and good thought, and good times with fellows afterwards. I'm John Lindquist. I am president of the Philosophy Club here on the UCM campus, and I'd like to welcome you all to the debate between Brandon Christian and Brother Jed Smock. Um, there is one thing I would like to ask of you all before we start, and that's for you all to take out your phones. Just, I'd like to see more action amongst the crowd. Just, just humor me. Do it. All right. Now, make absolutely certain that your phone is on silent. You do not want to be that one person whose phone goes off in the middle of this. Brandon here would like me to tell you that he will ask to talk to you individually. Or whoever's on the phone if it goes off. Yes. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for indulging me in that. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming here. I'd like to thank uh, MU Sasha, uh, the Secular Student Alliance here at UCM, and the Queers and Allies uh, Club here at UCM for helping out with um, putting together this debate. I'm very grateful. We're all very grateful for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Brother Jed Smock. Um, he is a former U.S. history professor, taught at the University of Wisconsin. Um, he has a uh, Master's of Arts in History from Indiana State, and most importantly, he has 40 years of preaching on campuses. That's, that's quite a bit of time. Um, he is the author of uh, five books, including his autobiography, Who Will Rise Up? And so if we could welcome Brother Jed Smock. Um, and then we have Brandon Christian. He is a UCM alumni uh, in history. He is currently in the grad program here, and he's studying communications with an emphasis in theory. Uh, he is a former Church of Christ preacher, and now we all know him as the atheist activist that he is today. So if we could welcome Brandon Christian. All right, now down to the actual logistics of the thing. Uh, tonight is, of course, going to be a debate between Brother Jed Smock and Brandon Christian. Um, the topic will be, uh, um, is it, <laughs> can one be consistently moral without belief in God? Um, Brandon Christian will be arguing affirmative, and Brother Jed Smock will be arguing in the negative. Thank you very much, and I will hand everything over to these guys now. I'll let you get situated. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm thrilled to see as many of you here as there are today. It's a great honor and pleasure to get to speak before you, and I thank each and every one of you for coming out and being witness of this debate. I believe that this is a very important topic, that topic again being, can one be consistently moral without believing in God? I think that's an important question that we as a society have to ask ourselves. And please note, I don't think this question is important because it's not yet been answered. No, as an atheist activist, I firmly believe it has been answered in the affirmative, which I shall argue tonight. Rather, I believe this question is important simply because not enough people know that it has been answered in the affirmative. There is a malicious myth and rumor that is pervasive throughout this society that non-believers, atheists, agnostics, and 
secularists of all stripes are not as moral as others. That we can cheat and not feel bad provided we are not caught. That we can lie and feel no remorse and no ill conscience concerning our actions. That we do not have strict standards or that we're all moral relativists. Put simply, I believe that this is not factually true. And I hope to show that throughout the course of this debate. If I miss any point, I do sincerely apologize. I have only 12 minutes to make my primary case. And if I do miss something, and if you'd like to talk to me afterwards in the question and answer session, or by all means, stopping me on campus and saying, hey, I have a question for you, then please feel free to do so. I'm always available. That being said, here we go. <clears throat> I'd like to start today by pointing out what I do not want to do. I'm not out to reinvent the wheel here, morally speaking. This is not about some new form of morality I'm going to advocate. We're talking about the moral basics, things that I believe any reasonable person could recognize as being moral behaviors. So on the positive side, charity, kindness, generosity, honesty, love, things of this nature. And on the negative side, stealing, cheating, lying, killing, or harming others. <clears throat> this is also not a debate about morality itself, either its origins or its nature. That debate would take hours, and we have before us only a scant 45 minutes or so. This is also not a debate about my personal moral philosophy. Suffice it to say, and as succinctly put as I can, it is secular humanism. That is secular, without regards to gods or religions, and humanism, a love and concern for the human species as a whole. And I'm certainly not arguing tonight that non-believers like myself are more moral than believers. I believe that that would be just as bad as saying that believers are more moral than non-believers. Rather, I am only arguing for equality in moral consistency between believers and non-believers alike. What I want to do is simple. I would like to present you with good and equal reasons that we non-believers have to be consistently moral in our intentions and our actions. In short, I am arguing the affirmative, that one does not need belief in God to be consistently moral. I'm going to do this by addressing several points put forward by Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland. He articulated several reasons that he believed Christians could be more moral than others, or have better reasons to be moral than others. Now, I think that Moreland's arguments could actually be applied to almost any theistic religion, a theistic religion being one that recognizes the existence of a god or gods. However, Moreland just so happened to be a Christian when he was writing, so he applied it to Christianity. Regardless, though, I'm going to argue concerning four of his primary points. Now, he put forward six, which I'd love to talk about, but we just don't have the time for that this evening. I'm going to claim that the reasons he gives are actually identical to secular humanist reasons to be consistently moral. And so if they count as reasons for theists, or those believing in gods, to be consistently moral, then they also count as reasons for non-theists, such as myself, to be consistently moral. The reasons that Moreland put forward are as follows. Because I love God, because I want to do good for its own sake, because I want a good life and a good afterlife, and because I recognize God as my creator. I'll simply be taking these in order, beginning now with the notion of love. Moreland claims that a theist will be more consistently moral towards others because they love God. So put in a personal statement, it might be something to the effect of, I love God, therefore I will be moral towards all of you. But first of all, my initial criticism is that I don't see a logical and clear connection between the two things. Loving God does not automatically entail being more moral towards others. It merely entails just that loving God. In addition to that, I should think that we would all agree that we'd be much happier if our moral interactions with each other were based on how we genuinely felt towards one another, not on how we felt about a third party. Wouldn't you rather me be polite to you for who you are and what you are as a human being, instead of being polite to you because I happen to value somebody across the room who's watching? I should think so. But more importantly, a secular humanist has just as good a notion of broad and inspiring love as does a theist. However, instead of loving God, I direct my love towards the human species as a whole. Instead of loving a third party and being moral towards you all because of that, I am moral towards you because I love and value you for who and what you are as human beings. <clears throat> now one could ask, well, why bother loving the human species? And a succinct answer would simply be because I can see and objectively measure its qualities. And within those qualities, I find certain qualities which I plainly find worth loving. 
So, at the end of the day, if love for God can be a motivator, a consistent motivator, for moral behavior on behalf of a theist, then it can also, if it is love for the human species as a whole, be seen as a consistent moral motivator for a secular humanist, such as myself. Now on to the idea of doing good for good's own sake. Moreland claims that the idea of, I want to do good or do right for its own sake, is inherently a theistic reason. However, I see no connection here to theism. One either desires to do good for its own sake, or one <coughs> desires to do good for some other reason. If one desires to do good for its own sake, that's all there is to it. There's nothing else that needs to be said, because doing good for its own sake is a religiously neutral stance. However, if one says, I want to do good for its own sake, and because it will make God happy, then they've undercut the idea of wanting to do good for good's own sake by adding an additional premise. It's not just for good's own sake at that point. <clears throat> that being the case, though, a secular humanist has just as much claim and just as much right to say, I want to do the right thing for its own sake, as does a theist, since good for its own sake is, again, a religiously neutral stance. Unless you redefine good to mean whatever your religion states that it means. However, that's cheating. That's playing a game of definitions to win, and I would hope that we are not here to do that. In any case, if goodness for its own sake, being a religiously neutral stance that it is, can be a consistent motivator for someone, then it could be a consistent motivator for anyone. Again, regard, pardon me, regardless of their religious convictions. It is accessible even to a secular humanist such as myself. Now on to doing good so as to have a good life and a good afterlife. This notion is really nothing more than rational self-interest. And there's nothing wrong with rational self-interest. I'm merely pointing out that's what this notion is. Rational self-interest is the same reason that we don't hold our hands over an open flame, or cuss out our bosses at work, or speed in front of the cops, especially near Lone Jack. <laughs> rational self-interest is not a theist-specific position. Atheists, agnostics, Christians, skeptics, all humans can be rationally self-interested. It's simply a human trait. Thus, for a secular humanist, who, like myself, is also a non-believer, we are just as interested in our own rational self-interest. However, the afterlife, for one like me, has no bearing on us. I don't believe in any form of afterlife, so it's not a motivating factor for me at all. However, I do very much believe in this life, obviously. It's the only life I know without a doubt that I have. In fact, this life here and now is the only life that any of us know beyond a doubt that we have, all other lives, either before or after this one, are hypotheses taken on faith. That being the case, it makes sense, since this is our only guaranteed life, to make this one count, to make it good. And I realize that if I want to live a good life, I must indeed live a genuinely and consistently moral life. For time and time again, studies have shown that immoral people tend to lead worse off lives. So if I do indeed desire a consistently good life, as I and I feel most, if not all, other people do, then I will also consistently desire to act in a genuinely moral way. And finally, on to debt as a reason to be moral. Moreland articulates the idea that I want to do good because I recognize God as my creator. And here I think the inherent notion is one of debt, saying, I believe that God made me, so I want to do good because I feel I owe it to God to do good. Or it could be the desire of living up to potential. I believe that God made me for good purposes, so I desire to do good to live up to that God-given potential. However, I'm not exactly clear on God having had a hand in making you. What makes us? What shapes us and forms the people that we are today? Our parents, our family, our friends, our experiences growing up, our community, our schools, and our society's institutions. But do notice that God is not obviously present in any of these situations. His presence is claimed by believers, and that's fine to claim that God exists and that he was there. However, it is not an objectively shown fact that God was there. But we do indeed know that the things I just mentioned were there having a hand in shaping us. Thus, a secular humanist can see that we owe much to our society. We owe much to the heroes who paved the way for us and the social institutions that help frame who we are today. So, a secular humanist can reason as follows. I desire to be moral so that I can embody the positive ideas that have been inculcated into me by society, by my family and friends, and by the institutions that have helped shape me growing up. Out of respect for those institutions and respect for the heroes who came before us, a secular humanist can reason that I want to live in a way that pays back the debt to them. 
and thus a secular humanist can feel a healthy debt to society, so to speak, and for its good components, pay it forward via moral action towards others, if that's what persuades them at the end of the day. In conclusion, what did I want to show you this afternoon? I simply wanted to tell you that I believe that non-believers can indeed be consistently moral. How did I go about doing this? Well, I went through several areas of morality outlined by Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland, and I show that they are fundamentally no different from secular humanistic reasons to be moral. They are equally applicable to believers and non-believers alike once you remove the component of belief in a deity. And we've seen that belief in a deity is not even inherently necessary for any of these factors to count as consistently motivating. So, can non-believers be consistently moral alongside their believing friends and neighbors and uh, people that they meet in the community? Yes, I do indeed believe we can. We have good reasons and we have good cause to consistently apply them. And ultimately, foundational to these points, we are only human. Theist, atheist, agnostic, skeptic, labelless, one and all are only human beings. And our differences in epistemology, in the understanding of the world and its nature, no matter how vast they might seem, are normally not so vast that we cannot all at least agree that it is wrong to needlessly and wantonly hurt others, and it is always a good thing to see a fellow human being smile. I now yield my time uh, to my honorable opponent for the purposes of cross-examination, and I thank you for hearing my points. Uh, Brandon, would you tell us what your standard is that you appeal to for determining whether you're being a good person or a bad person or anybody else is good or bad? What is your standard? As succinctly put as it is, and I don't believe that it's simple enough to be done justice by, by easy answers, but as succinctly as I can put it, I ask myself, what has science shown us about human nature? And I don't just mean science like beakers and test tubes. I mean other forms of science as well, as well social sciences, psycho psychological sciences. I ask myself, under what systems and what circumstances can my fellow human beings be made most happy and be made to flourish? I then hold myself to the standards of compassion for others and integrity for myself. If my actions towards others is based on compassion, empathy and love for them, and integrity or love for myself and a desire to be a good person, and if my desires to do certain actions towards others falls in line with what I believe has been shown to be beneficial for human beings, then I consider it a moral action. Although I will add, I think it is impossible to know for certainty. There will always be some inherent ignorance when dealing with others, and that's unfortunately just a fact of life. On what grounds would you, as I soon would say, condemn a Hitler who thought certain races were inferior to others, and he actually, apparently, actually believed that. The Aryan race was uh, uh, superior, so he said, well, let's eliminate the inferior races, and only the Aryans will interbreed, and we'll move man to the uh, superman. On what grounds uh, would you condemn him? I would start by simply saying that as human beings, we can't fly by the seat of our pants in figuring out what is or is not moral. We have to constantly be checking and rechecking our notions and making sure they comport to what actually is real and what actually will be better for others. That being the case, I think that anyone who is truly healthy, nominally well-functioning as a human being, and is actually applying critical thinking can quickly and easily see that the things that Hitler and those like Hitler advocated are not compassionate things. They're selling out on their own sense of empathy towards their fellow man. That would be the first strike, is that Hitler had murdered his own sense of empathy and thus his own ability to live a fulfilling and moral life. In addition to that, Ralph, yes. we're running out of time here. Uh, how do you account for the fact that there are apparently so many bad people? And I think we all have violated what we think we ought to do at times. And, and some people are very wicked, murderers, Hitler we talk about. There are some people who indeed, because of circumstance, because of genetics, because of what they were taught growing up, there are some people who, unfortunately, have fallen through the cracks, morally so they're speaking. they're not to blame. Oh, I'm not saying that they are not to blame for all of their actions. I'm saying that the entire notion is far too complicated to simply say they are to blame or they are not to blame. 
one must be aware of the circumstances compelling a person to act a certain way before you can actually step back and make an objective judgment. That does not mean that such judgments are impossible. I can say and mean that what Hitler did was grotesque, evil, and wrong. However, the reasons cannot simply be cut and tried and, and always succinct and simple. Not all things in life that are worth having, including moral knowledge, are simple. Can one be consistently moral without believing in God? If there is a benevolent creator who made man in his own image, then one cannot be moral without believing in him. If there is a God and he imparted unto us life, then it is the height of wickedness and arrogance to deny him. Indeed. If there is a good God, not only must we acknowledge His existence, we have a responsibility to love and to serve Him. <coughs> Suppose one has the reputation as a philanthropist who feeds the hungry and shelters the homeless. Then it is discovered that his parents are housed in a tenement without heat in the winter and live on a diet of cat food. And this alleged philanthropist has not lifted a finger to help them. If he were exposed for his indifference to his own parents, he would suddenly lose his reputation because it is axiomatic that charity begins at the home. The philanthropist's first responsibility would be to his father and mother who imparted unto him the gift of life and cared for him when he was a helpless infant. So it is with our Heavenly Father, the ultimate source of life and all that is good. Our first responsibility is to Him. We cannot be moral and deny Him or refuse to serve Him. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The Apostle Paul pictures man as suppressing or wrestling against the truth. Immoral men use all their education, intellectual ability, uh, abilities, and reasoning powers to deny God who's revealed in nature. And they refuse to listen to their conscience, which convicts them of their evil deeds. Instead, they follow the lust of their own flesh, which drives them into the blackness of darkness and unbelief. Sinful men's problem with God is not lack of evidence for Christianity's claim. It is not an intellectual problem. It is a moral problem. Acknowledging the God of love requires men to turn from their selfish ways to live a life of love and self-sacrifice. Faith in God obliges them to turn from a life of carelessness to a life of accountability and responsibility to God and to their fellows. Men, who refuse God's moral standard, come up with their own standard, either by every man doing that which is right in his own eyes, or else men claim to follow some mythical, ever-changing social contract. Adam, by eating of the forbidden fruit, was determining his own standard for right and wrong, instead of following God's reasonable command which permitted him to eat of all the fruit of the, of the garden, except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Alas, Adam chose to experience evil by eating of the tree. This is the sin of all godless men. They decide for themselves right and wrong. And ex instead of accepting the laws of nature and nature's God, Having sinned, 
wicked men then seek their own way of forgiveness and atonement. Adam's son Cain approached God for forgiveness by offering his best crops as a sacrifice unto God instead of offering the required blood sacrifice like his brother Abel. Immorality is going one's own way instead of the way of the Lamb, which was slain from the foundation of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ. Abel accepted the need of a blood sacrifice for forgiveness, as symbolized by a sacrifice of the best lamb of his flock. Therefore, Abel was accepted of God, and his arrogant brother Cain rejected. Instead of doing right, Cain murders Abel. And so it has been ever since. The unbeliever opposes the believer. All human action can be summarized in the battle between unbelief and faith. Between men who follow God and those who follow Satan and their own evil tendencies. If there is no God, who or what is the source and foundation of morality. Morals deal with right and wrong in our interpersonal relationships. Morals are personal. The source of morals must be connected with a personal God who himself is a subject of moral obligation and who chooses to use his great powers morally. Atheists affirm that all that exists is matter, energy, space, and time. The problem for atheism is that these elements are not enough to support the existence of morality. Matter, energy, space, and time are impersonal and non-moral. How does the personal come out of the impersonal? How does the moral come out of stuff that is non-moral. Men universally have a sense of moral obligation. I ought. I ought not. What is the source of moral obligation? How in a world which is ultimately the product of time, chance, and material, pro uh, material particles, did there come to be such a thing as moral obligations. The existence of moral obligations makes more sense in a universe in which the ultimate reality is a moral person than it does in a universe where moral persons are a late and insignificant byproduct of impersonal forces. The notion of morals requires a moral governor. That moral governor is the God of the Bible. Much of morality is simply a matter of respecting the worth and value of persons. And that seems more reasonable in a universe which is ultimately personal. If the universe is impersonal, then morality makes no sense. And mankind is reduced to the survival of the fittest. Might makes right. Red in tooth and claw. To have good morals, we must look to a person who is the ultimate example of good morals, which would be Almighty God as He's reflected in the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. God governs the material universe with physical laws of cause and effect. God governs man according to moral law. These moral laws are reflected in God's character. Without knowing God, one has an incomplete understanding of moral obligations. Of course, all reasonable men would agree on rudimentary codes, such as one ought not to torture babies for fun. Although a moral relativist cannot say that with certainty. I challenge Brandon or anyone else to come up with a more reasonable, just, and ethical standard than that which is written in the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, 
the Sermon on the Mount. This standard is exemplified in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone in this room can come up with a better moral standard than God's moral law, then I will reject the Judeo-Christian ethic and follow their moral system. If Brandon or someone else can find a better example to follow than Jesus Christ, I will cast off Christianity and follow their religious or philosophical figure. If we're going to reject the biblical standard, which has well served man for ages, then we must come up with one that is at least equal and or better in one which has demonstrated itself to be equal or better for generations of men. Without a perfect and universal standard, we can't even define moral man. Jesus defined the moral standard that all men must achieve to be considered a child of God. A lawyer asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus answered him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, all thy soul, and all thy strength. He said, that's the first and the greatest commandment. He said, the second is likened unto the first. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Paul reduced the requirements of good morals to one word, love. He wrote in Romans chapter 13, Owe no man anything but to love another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no will towards his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Does Brandon or anyone else perhaps profess to have consistently lived up to this high standard? If there's anyone here who's never blasphemed God, disobeyed their parents, or lied, or cheated, if you've ever done wrong and have not been forgiven and cleansed from your wrongdoing through Jesus Christ, then you are not a moral person. Thank you. Beginning with my cross examination. Okay, it's on. Beginning with my cross examination. Um, Jed, would you say that uh, that rape is wrong? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Would, would you say that killing someone else because you disagree with them is wrong? Uh, just simply because of that, I would. Yes. Would you say that slavery is wrong? Um, would depend upon the circumstances. Uh, we have, uh, we have, you know, our, our prisoners in our state and federal prisons, they're slaves of the state. They have uh, violated uh, their right to run free in society. That's an interesting take on slavery, and I'll file that away. Um, but you do believe it's wrong to rape, you believe it's wrong to kill because uh, you disagree with someone, you believe that slavery... I believe it's wrong to murder. I don't believe well, yes, all killing that, is wrong. Murder would be unjustifiable yeah. homicide. All right, and would you think it's justifiable homicide to kill someone because they disagree with you about what day of the week it is or whether or not chicken wings are better than uh, honey barbecue? Well, certainly we don't uh, uh, kill someone over uh, a matter of, of their taste in food. Okay, all right. Um, you know, that's all I need. Thank you. I'm going to take a few minutes of my preparation time. Okay. Thanks.
Not being passive aggressive, I actually just had to clear my throat. <laughs> <laughs> John, tell me when you have me set for seven minutes. This is this is better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, now you see why I'm here. Uh, after listening to that, I hope you're aware that's some of the thoughts about people who are like me, people who are non-believers, some of the, the ideas that we have to put up with that are thrown against us, that we're non-believers because we choose to go revel in our own sins. And don't get me wrong, I do that every Saturday morning. It's my version of a bath. But, uh, you know, that's, that's all joking aside, that's actually not true. That's the malicious myth about atheists that I was talking about earlier. Um... Before I start, I want to talk a little bit about God from the Old Testament. I'm not inherently here to get into a, a, a God debate, but I do feel it's pertinent because we were told a few minutes ago that to be moral, we have to line up with God. Well, let's see what God has to say about morality. What if I told you about a tyrant who lived far, far away? An evil man who had women raped, had people killed by the thousands for disagreeing with him, enslaved others and approved of slavery, killed people for their land, and killed them for their beliefs. You wouldn't trust that man when it came to issues of morality. You wouldn't go to him and ask him what charities you should donate to, or anything else like that. You would rightfully judge him by his deeds as being evil. You wouldn't look to him for moral advice. I have just described God from the Old Testament to you. In the Old Testament, God and Moses both approve of the rape of the Midianites in Numbers chapter 31. He orders the murder of many different people. Uh, he orders the murder of people who don't listen to priests, i.e. disagree with them, orders the murder of homosexuals, orders the murder of people who have premarital sex, so most youths, um, <laughs> orders the murder of people who are of other religions. In short, any reason you could think of that wouldn't necessarily be a good reason to end a life, God of the Old Testament ordered it as a reason to end a life. 
He permitted slavery in Leviticus chapter 25. He even condoned sexual slavery, which I find personally abhorrent, in Exodus chapter 21. He had the Israeli people kill in the name of conquest in the story of the conquest of Canaan. If you would call a human being evil for doing those things, and if you would stand up to them and try to stop them, then why let God off the hook? I'm not trying to be insulting to those out there tonight who believe in God. I'm merely looking at the Bible critically and raising important criticisms. If we're going to make the claim, as was just made, that we have to comport with the Bible to be moral, let's look to the character of God in the Bible and see just how morally pleasant that character was. I think we'll find him severely wanting in that regards. That being the case, I would simply like to make the statement, I, as a baseless and moralless atheist, if I saw that God, if I knew that he was real, if he appeared in the room right here beside me, I would try to hit him simply because of all the ills he perpetrated on the earth in the Old Testament and all the ills he allowed to happen in the succeeding years since its writing. I believe that if he did exist, rebellion would be the only moral option. But that's okay, because I don't think he exists, so that's not really an issue for me. I'm simply pointing out that if that were the case, I would expect any decent person in this room to pick up a spear and help me fight. That being the case, we were told that if there's a benevolent creator, that's a big if, that we have to line up with him and we have to love and serve him. Again, that if has not been conclusively shown at all. Indeed, in a world where parasites routinely can enter you, parasitize your body and painfully emerge, in a world with cancer, in a world with a host of horrible diseases that wreak havoc on human lives when they're too young to understand what's going on, in a world of genocidal madmen like Adolf Hitler and others, I'm rather questioning the notion that there is a benevolent and all-powerful force behind everything that's going on here. <clears throat> and if God did indeed turn out to be immoral, as I think the God of the Old Testament is, then it would not be incumbent upon us to be following him if we wanted to be moral. Indeed, as I said, the only moral response would be one of instant rebellion, if he existed. The Brother Jed gave the example of the faulty philanthropist who kept his parents locked up in a horrible tenant house, but he didn't tell us anything about the philanthropist's reasons. Were his parents horrible racist bigots? We don't know. He told us nothing about his parents. And I don't believe that you automatically have to honor someone just because they're older than you or because they spawned you. Rather, if you're going to honor them, it should be based on their actions. Are they genuinely worth honoring and following? Um, he said that sinful man's problems are, with belief are not intellectual, that they're based on selfishness and sin. Uh, that's new to me, and I'm a non-believer. I had no idea that my many intellectual grievances with the Bible were premised on nothing more than my desire to sleep in on Sundays. But apparently I was wrong in my evaluation of myself. In all seriousness, though, I do not believe that claims like that should be taken seriously. It's just painting with broad brushstrokes and asserting that he can tell you what I'm thinking because I'm not a Christian. He can't. Only I can, and even then it's through the indirect and messy medium of speech and language. Um, he says that, uh, that non-believers don't have any good cause to be moral. And once again, I say, now you see why I'm here, or putting forth the points which I did. He said that we make up what's good and evil. This is not true at all. Figuring out what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, this is a difficult, some would say insurmountable, but I think they would be wrong, but this is the very least an extremely difficult task. We're dealing with other human beings from complex backgrounds and cultures who themselves have complex psyches and personalities. If we're going to figure out what right and wrong are, it's going to take a lot of concerted work, critical thinking, and strong effort. But then again, when did you find something in life worth having that didn't take any effort whatsoever? When did you find something in life that was just handed to you in soundbite answers, and you were able to rest assured knowing that it was all genuine and complete truth? I'll cut it short for you and just let you know, that has never happened to you before. And there's a good reason for it. If it's worth having in this life, and I do believe that morality is worth having, it's worth taking the time to figure out what exactly it is. And the fact that I cannot give you soundbite answers does not entail that I'm wrong. I explained to you earlier that a non-believer like myself can be moral based on our love for others, based on our compassion and integrity, our drive to be a good person. None of these things require, automatically, none of these things philosophically necessitate the existence of a deity. Uh, he mentioned some things about the golden rule I wanted to uh, point out. He said that the Bible is the best standard of morals ever given. This is a blatant assertion. 
And there's no actual philosophical or logically compelling reason for you to believe this assertion. However, he does say that if we can't present with, uh, if we cannot present him with a better moral code, that we have to automatically give up and follow the Bible. <laughs> if I told you that horsepower and engines was actually small horses on treadmills running to power your car, you would not need to spend years at a vocational school or tech school or college learning how internal combustion engines work to tell me, I don't think that's how it actually works. <laughs> I, I, as a person who has a detraction against the Bible, it is not incumbent upon me to deliver a brand new synthesized form of morality to replace it. All I need to do is point out its flaws, which I did just a few minutes ago in this speech. But I want to end this by saying, I hope that you can see in just the comparison between our two opening statements, that I have given good and consistent and compelling reasons for non-believers to be moral. And what you heard was a repetition of dogma, and not any actual legitimate argumentation against the notion of a non-believer being consistently moral. I once again thank you for your time, and I now cede the floor again to Jeff. The celebrated atheist and existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, We say that God does not exist, and that it is necessary to draw the consequences of his absence right to the end. The existentialist is strongly opposed to a certain type of secular moralism which seeks to suppose God at the least to suppose God at the least possible expense. Towards 1880, when the French professors endeavored to formulate a secular morality, they said, nothing will be changed if God does not exist. We shall rediscover the same norms of honesty, progress, and humanity. We shall have disposed of God as an out-of-date hypothesis which will die away quietly of itself. Brandon would seem to agree with these French professors that there is a secular morality, that faith in God is not necessary for good morals. But Sartre strongly disagrees with Brandon and other secular morals. Sartre continues, the existentialist, on the contrary, finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist. For there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible universe. There can no longer be any good a priori, since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think in. It is nowhere written that good exists, that one must be honest or must not lie, since we are now upon the plane where there are only men, Dostoevsky once wrote, if God does not exist, everything would be permitted. And for that, existentialism is the starting point. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. And man is in consequence forlorn, for he cannot find anything to depend upon either within or outside of himself. Does an atheist have the nerve to admit what Sartre has logically concluded, without God, everything is permitted? I would hope that there will be agnostics or atheists in this audience who might as aggressively challenge Brandon's secular moralism as they will likely challenge my God-centered morality. First John chapter 4 teaches, immorality is transgression of God's law. God's law requires that we love Him supremely and our neighbor equally. Therefore, immorality, or what the Bible calls sin, would be to love self-supremely. Sin is selfishness. Men universally know that it is wrong to be selfish. There is not a person in this room who's not condemned selfishness in others. 
One of the first concepts little children learn is, that's selfish. Uh, you won't let me play with your toy. Conscience and reason affirms that it is wrong for others to be selfish. Then it is wrong for me to be selfish. It is wrong for you to be selfish. It is wrong for us all to be selfish. You do not want anyone to be selfish towards you, so you should not be selfish towards others. Treat others as you would be treated. This is the law and the prophets. This is the Bible. These laws are written on men's hearts and minds by Almighty God. Jesus said, Greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. And of course it's Jesus. He's the standard ultimately that we must look to to decide what we ought to be. And anything that falls short of Jesus Christ and His standard and His character in us is immorality. Occasionally we hear of men giving their life for their friends. Yet Jesus' standard of love is much higher. According to Romans 5, 6, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God commended His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the loving God of the Bible who becomes a man to atone for the sins of mankind that the atheists are attacking as being some sort of bad God. God's standard of morality is nothing short of perfection. Only the Christian can reach such a lofty goal or has hopes of reaching this pinnacle of morality. Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be called the children of your Father which is in heaven. For if you love those which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the unbelievers do the same? And if you salute your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the pagans do so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So God demands that we be perfect in love. And if we are not loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself, and remember love has no malice or ill will towards anyone. If we're not walking in this sort of perfection, then according to the Bible, we are not moral men, we are sinful men, and we're all in need of a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus. Are you folks in the back, are you guys leaving or are you just kind of... Make it worth a while. You guys can say it if you want to, I'm just trying to figure out before I start. Cool. You act on your free agency, sir. Alright. This is my three minute closing. Are you ready? Yep. Alright. I'm not going to offer much rebuttal. This is just a three-minute summation of my position on things. I do want to point out that what Brother Jed did was point out that John Paul Sartre said something. I don't worship God, and I also happen to not worship John Paul Sartre. In fact, there's a whole host of people and things that I don't worship, namely all. 
So I'm not going to dogmatically follow the writings of one existentialist philosopher. Jean-Paul Sartre's conclusions were his own. My conclusions have led me to decide that there are very good and compelling reasons for me to be genuinely loving and moral towards others, and I will strive every day to embody those conclusions and that genuine care, love, and concern for others. Why am I moral? To recap, I am moral because I value doing the right thing for its own sake. I see it as intrinsically important and valuable to do. I am moral because I desire to live a good life. This is the only one I'll ever be guaranteed to have, and I want it to count. And I realize that if it's going to count, I must be genuinely moral. I can't put on a show or a pretense, and I do not pretend to. I want to be moral because I do indeed recognize a certain debt I have to some of society's better institutions. Things such as the educational system, our ability to express ourselves freely in this society. I'm not saying I agree with everything that the United States has done or is doing, but there are indeed some institutions which I feel I owe a great debt to, and I will honor them in my actions with others. And ultimately, I am moral because I love you. You, each and every one of you. And I'm not afraid to admit it. I'm a secular humanist, and I value and love and care about you because of who you are and what you are as my fellow human beings, and that will not change unto my dying day. The components of my morality are quite simple when distilled down to their purest elements. They are compassion for others and integrity for myself. What did I set out to do today? Only to show that non-believers such as myself have consistent reasons and consistent ability to be moral towards others. And I believe that the reasons that I have stated today remain compelling. I could expand on them more, but alas, 45 minutes is not enough time, and I would never pretend that it was, and I'm sure you would not either. Suffice it to say, I believe that these reasons I gave today, in addition to ones which I would happily give you if ever I met you on the street, stand as being compelling. Despite all the dogma, despite all the assertions that we've heard today, come from my honorable opponent. I've heard no genuinely compelling reason given by him why I won't be moral based on the reasons that I gave, why I would not hold a door open for you or help you out in any other way, regardless of your level of need. I hope that we each see that tonight. I do strongly feel that our society, both here on the micro level at UCM and society abroad in its much larger context, here in this nation and around the globe, would do itself a whole host of good if only we could move past the idea that someone who's not like me cannot be as moral as I am. In the end, though, I leave you to see that. I leave you to draw your conclusions, and I will respect them just as I respect and value you. Thank you all for your time, and thank you to my opponent for being here today for this debate. Brandon says he loves us all, and I suppose he does in some sort of an affectionate, uh, natural way. But I've yet to hear a definition from him as to what love is. It is relatively easy to love those who love us. Man without God sometimes do that. I would even acknowledge that occasionally godless men give their lives for a friend or even a stranger. But I've never heard of an atheist giving his life for a Christian. However, I have heard of many Christians who have been martyred for the sake of atheists, unbelievers, pagans, idolaters. However, the only one who has given his life for their enemies would be Jesus and his followers. It requires the example of Christ in his spirit in one's life for a man to truly love his enemies to the point where he would be willing to die in his enemy's place. The only thing that would convince me that Brandon or any other man is moral without faith in God would be their readiness to give their life for an enemy and for the sake of God. This is the requirement of Christian morality. The church has a long list of martyrs who have done this very thing, beginning with St. Stephen, who, as he was being stoned by a religious crowd, cried out his last words, Lord, lay not this sin to, the, to their charge. 
I would like to know the list of atheists who have been martyred for their bold stand for denying God. I am not suggesting that no atheist ever been killed for their atheism, but no atheist has ever been killed out of an unselfish motive. If men are not motivated by a love for God and others, then there is no virtue in their actions. In what has become known as the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, it is written, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity or God's love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, the love of God, it profits me nothing. So we see, God doesn't just judge by our actions. God judges by our motives. Why we do what we do. And if we're not motivated by a love for Him and a love for others, then all of our outwardly moral acts are as filthy rags and we are morally bankrupt without God. Thank you. I lied. I'm going to keep arguing. Um, no. Thus ends the debate. Um, it's come to its conclusion now. We're going to start a question and answer process shortly, which I'll explain. But before I do that, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight and taking time out of your schedules to engage in an important conversation. Each and every day that we interact with each other, in a very real sense, we are creating the society around us. It is a participatory process. When you engage in substantive issues such as these, when you engage in these issues and the critical thinking, the self-examination, and the speaking with others who disagree that goes along with these issues, you are taking a very real part at doing what you are nominally here at college to do, which is build the future of this country and the global society it is a part of. That being said, I will step down off my soapbox and go ahead and uh, usher in the question and answer session. Um, Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to take this mic and put it right up here by the stand um, next to lovely Miss Emma. And we're going to ask that anyone who has a question for Jed or myself, please file up here. We're going to form as much of a line as we can despite the columns. Uh, Emma is going to ask you if you have a question for Jed or myself. And she's going to do an alternating Jed me, Jed me, Jed me uh, style of questions, beginning with Brother Jed. Um, I will warn you, uh, as much as I uh, want there to be really good questions, we've already agreed, uh, Brother Jed, myself, and others up here, if it seems like you're going on a tangent and not asking a question, or if you get rude towards either of us, you'll be cut off immediately, you'll be asked to please leave the room, the microphone will not be given back to you, and there will not be a second chance to restate your question or actually ask it. So please refrain from speech making, we'll give you time to get to your point and ask it, but uh, no soapboxes, and by all means, no rudeness. So that being, no, pardon me, that being said, if you have any questions, if you could please uh, go ahead and start lining up over here and just let Emma know which speaker your question is for. Well, that was fast. It's nice seeing all of you here this evening. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Share that mic, don't forget. Oh, 
I have a question for Brandon. Yes. Where did you get where did you get the idea that there is such a thing as good? I mean, what where did you get that idea? Um, well, I mean, that's asking, it's kind of like asking me where I learned to tie my shoes. I've grown up hearing about the notion of good. I can't go, oh, September 3rd, it was a cold day. Uh, there, there is no exact point in time where I can pinpoint and say, this is where I got the idea. As I've come of age and grown, the topic of good, what is good, what is the right thing to do, has consistently been a pertinent question. And I don't really believe that asking where does the question originate from will do us much, ser much service. Now, the topic of good, I think, will naturally arise anytime you get a species that has to interact socially with one another and is conscious. So, you know, we as uh, conscious, sentient, interacting things are going to have to develop some set of guidelines for how we interact with each other, especially since we've also evolved the ability to feel empathy towards others. So, I mean, an ant, even though it's a social being, doesn't have empathy towards another ant. They just do ant stuff. Um, <laughs> We do people stuff, which is being moral, asking questions like, how should I treat you as another human being? How should you treat me as a human being? How are we going to adapt to those things? So while I can't pinpoint and say, oh, here, this is X book, this is X person, this is X time in my life where the notion of the good first entered my vocabulary, I can tell you that I feel that overall our species' obsession with what is good is a simple byproduct of what it is that we've evolved to be throughout the generations. A social being which is self-aware and interested in how it interacts with its fellows. So, as I understand it, you have no basis for the idea of good, and you have no definition for the idea of what is good. Right? If you throw out everything that I just said, then yes, that would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's very reasonable. You've been very honest and given us no reason, no explanation. You've given us a bunch of words. You're on a soapbox. Do you have a question? That would be all. Okay, thank you. So I noticed one axiom in your argument that we uh, owe, basically owe God for him creating us. Is this? Well, not solely uh, because he created us, but because he is a loving creator who has provided for us so wonderfully. He uses his power responsibly and wisely and lovingly. He's not arbitrary. So do you say we for sure owe a debt to him or we ought to owe a debt to him? Uh, would you enunciate what you what distinction you're making there? Uh, I noticed a lot of your morality was based on us kind of owing God and God being the representation of good. However, in there, there's an assumption that we should be exactly like God in order to be moral, right? Yeah, we should be godlike in character in order to be moral. And that's his purpose, is to develop us in this lifetime conformed to the character of Christ to prepare us for heaven. Okay. This is a complex question. I'm sorry. I probably better take this more from a personal level. But never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm also, if you guys could speak directly into the mic, like a couple inches away, because it's so we're just having some problems uh, hearing what, what, back. Why don't you give us a mic? Take it out of there so they... <laughs> Hi. Okay, one thing that really oh, drew me to this is the fact that the sheet said that you were a former, like a pastor, yes. to atheists, and I respect you for making this argument. I want to know what made you go to such different extremes. I know, and I hope that you don't mind that I ask. No, 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 no. Your question is perfectly fine. It is, uh, why did I go from being a, a Christian preacher in training and actually acting as a preacher to being an atheist activist? Yes. Okay. Um, succinctly put, the biggest reason um, was philosophy. In my reading and studying of philosophy, I first came across Euthyphro's Dilemma, which asks, is that which is good, good because God values it, or does God value it because it is good? If the first answer is the one you go with, then goodness is arbitrary. God's just making good up as he goes along, and we as the weaker kids on the block have to listen to him. Um, and if you go with the second part of that question and say, well, God acknowledges what good is and then tells us, that makes God a middleman who has to be observant of a higher power than himself, namely what good actually is. He has to acknowledge it and he can't change it. 
And both were, of course, distasteful for the traditional brand of Christian theism I'd been brought up on, the very conservative one. And um, that's not what made me an atheist, but it, got, it shook my faith a little bit, so I started looking around, and, and I set about to try to prove my faith right. And in every realm, in philosophy, in, uh, in uh, sociology, in uh, the sciences, I found the Bible's answers not stacking up against answers uh, either A, that mankind had figured out over the ages, or B, against the simple, honest answer of, I don't know. You know ultimately, in the end, all the questions I was asking of the Bible could either better be answered by secular means or by a simple, honest shrug of the shoulders and a... <laughs> so, you know, eventually, uh, I decided that I could not force myself to have faith. That wouldn't be a genuine life. That wouldn't be a genuine belief system. There'd be no credit to just forcing myself to believe something. So I left the church, and uh, it took some time to be willing to, to finally come to terms with the fact that I was an atheist. But when I did, I've been chugging right along and haven't looked back since. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I'm going to have you stand right in front of the mic stand again. Sorry, keep telling you guys a few things you got to do. Right here? This is good. On one foot. <laughs> Say right. the alphabet backwards before you begin. Right. Uh, I actually have a question for both of you. Uh, I'll first start with you. Uh, did you say that God's law or uh, God's law, of the land, God's nature, is where we get all of our moral knowledge from? I appeal actually to the Declaration of Independence, the law as they stated, the laws of nature and nature's God. I believe God's law is written upon the heart and mind of men. It's our conscience. Con means with, with knowledge. We all have an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, good and evil. Even a thief knows it's wrong to steal. Uh, try stealing from the thief, and he'll, he'll get the idea. So all men have willfully violated what they know to be right, and therefore stand guilty and condemned. Okay. And for you, would you say that um, your knowledge of the laws or whatever, your, your particular beliefs that you don't have to have uh, belief in a certain um, God or whatever because that revelation has already been passed down? Um, if I understand your question correctly, I, I don't believe that you've got to have an origin point that's telling you exactly what right and wrong is to figure out what right and wrong is. I think that you and me, not just you and me, but you know, dozens of other people can and are actively engaging in trying to figure out how we ought to treat each other. And there are some very basic things that humanity's figured out along the way. Um, things like do unto others. In Christianity, it's called the golden rule. It's been articulated in other philosophies and belief systems, either before or after Christianity. It's one of those basic axiomatic statements that humankind seems to stumble onto in the process of discussing with each other. Well, how should I treat you, and how should you treat me? Um, you know, so if I understand your, your, your question um, completely, my answer would just be that I don't believe that we have an objective entity telling us what right and wrong is, but I also don't believe we need one. I think all we need is open, honest, and respectful dialogue with one another and a determination to figure out what we should be doing. And while I discount the idea of perfection as being a silly notion and one that's unattainable, I do think that we can get progressively better at how we behave and act towards one another the more we work at it. And it's quite worth having despite the effort it takes to get there. Okay, so your argument is basically that religion doesn't determine you being moral or not. Uh, yes, I do not believe that religion determines if you're moral. And if I get this correctly, your debate is that um, not necessarily that uh, you can't be moral without religion, but that you can't be perfectly moral. The we level have to of consider what is the standard of morality. I haven't heard Brandon giving a definite standard. The standard of the Bible is love God supremely and your neighbor equally. And anyone living up, not not living up to that, whether they profess to be a Christian or not, uh, is uh, is immoral. So the debate is really the question. Well, the debate is really the standard of immorality. Yeah. What is the standard of morality? Standard. I mean, we can all invent our own standard of morality and claim we're living up to it. And you're saying that with God's nature, God's law, that's that intended guided morality? 
uh, as, and uh, Jesus is the God. He is the standard that we are to conform to. And I challenge anyone, again, to come up with a, more, a better example than Him. Okay, can I ask you, um, how do you feel... Uh, we was kind of limited to one. Oh, oh okay. I'll see. You know, give the others a chance, perhaps. And, and if we want, we can get back to you. Uh, this is to Brother Jed. You say that one cannot truly be moral unless they accept God? Yes. Obviously, not everyone in the world is going to accept God. But don't you think it's important for those who do not to strive for morality? I think it's important that we all strive for morality, yes. And all men can find God. He's revealed Himself through nature and through conscience. My point is that men are willfully ignorant of God. Don't and they're willfully ignorant of their moral obligation. Don't you think it's important, even if they're not religious or don't believe in God, to strive for at least human decency or what Brandon believes is what Brandon defines as morality and what a lot of people agree is morality, not as the religious definition. Well, you know, that's uh, as high as his standard goes. I would encourage people to try to reach that, to be kind to one another, uh, nice to one another, polite. I don't think generally men are. Men are generally sinners, and, and there's so much wickedness in the world. Okay, thank you. Um, I have kind of a question for both of you. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, both of you raised the issue of the obligations of morality reflect the nature of a relationship that you have, either a relationship to the community or a relationship to God. But uh, what if that relationship turns negative? Like communities put people in bad positions all the time, or one might arguably say that God puts somebody in a bad situation like Job. Uh, why is it that when the relationship is negative, that shouldn't then reflect into our moral obligations, like we no longer, like we have a negative uh, moral obligation, like maybe retribution against the society that we didn't like. Like, how do you prevent that if that's the if that's the moral standard that both of you offered? Do you remember the first word? Yes. Not sure I understand the question. Um, uh, if I understand your question, I would say that the form of morality I'm talking about. I would say that the form of morality I'm talking about isn't solely based on my interaction with the community. It arises uh, from my interaction with the community. I can figure out what constitute moral actions by interacting with the community. So just me out in the woods, I couldn't figure out exactly how things like altruism would be moral. If I'm interacting with others and you and I are having to like split money for lunch or something like that, I can start figuring out uh, altruistic actions However, if I then catch you, after, after I figure it out with interacting with you and others, if I then catch you stealing someone else's money or acting unaltruistically in an undefensible way, then I can say, hey, I figured out that that's wrong. And you're doing that wrong thing now, so I'm going to try to stop you. Uh, in terms of instances in, in particular, uh, how that morality plays out is dependent on how the community and myself are interacting with each other. And I think that my understanding of morality is built on my interaction with others. But I wouldn't say, uh, I would say that that's where my ability to say, okay, I disagree with this part of society and I have got to so say. You're it. saying that uh, other standards will basically stop you from having, from that negative relationship intervening. Yes. If I first learn from the community I grow up in about goodness and altruism, but then find out that the state in which that community is based does not practice goodness and altruism. I can then say, hey, wait a second, I've learned that something's better than what you're doing, and I think what you're doing is wrong based on what I've learned, and I can then, I don't know, run for state senator and try to change it, or uh, write about it in the local paper or take an antagonistic relationship. Okay. Would you restate the question, please? Um, I'm wondering, uh, for you specifically, I'm wondering if you have a negative relationship with God and your, and your basis of your moral obligations is a reflection of your relationship with God, won't that negatively impact your moral obligations if say God like God put Job in a bad situation to test Job's faith uh, to make a point I think was the I'm not very familiar with the Bible but what if his moral obligations are based on that relationship wouldn't the negativity of that relationship impact his morals well God will put us in circumstances he will test us he tested his own son 
he, uh, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. It's because testing, if we successfully pass the test, builds our character. Your professors give you examinations. It might be a multiple choice test. Usually there are four possible answers. Well, three of them are wrong. Why does the professor give you three wrong answers? Well, he wants to encourage you to study, to see whether you've learned the material, and uh, so that you'll have incentive to learn. And so the test, Job passed the test, and he was a good man to start out with. But he, after passing this great test, he was an even better man. So you're saying the negativity is something useful to be overcome? Well, uh, suffering can be good. It can either bring out what is best out of us or what's worst out of us. And a lot of us will fail our test. Adam failed the test. He ate of the tree. Uh, the second Adam, Jesus passed every test. He never sinned. He always did what was right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out the free pizza just arrived. <laughs> Okay, Brandon, uh, because I've heard your uh, sermons before, uh -huh. I was just wondering, do you think that your Christian background has affected your views and standpoints as an atheist on morality? Um, it certainly left me with a disposition to want to find black and white absolutes. I was trained for so long to think in terms of black and white absolutes, and uh, a lot of defining my morality back in those days came from first defining who the immoral people were and saying, well, what we're doing is better than them because they're bad. Um, I'm not saying that I don't believe that they're immoral people. I do, and I do see what they do as being bad. I'm not a moral relativist. I don't think that everything is gray, as the saying goes. Uh, however, I have had to work a lot harder at not quickly classifying people and saying, Oh, you're X? Well, then you're wrong. Oh, you're Y? Well, then you're right. I've had to deal with people as individuals more and teach myself to critically analyze what it is they're actually saying and what they actually believe before I can say, okay, you're probably a good person or you're probably a bad person. So you're saying that it has somewhat affected your viewpoints as to what is... Somewhat. I mean, you know, I, spent, I grew up uh, as a Christian and then I spent five years in a very, I mean, you were there with me, in a very conservative <laughs> church. So, yeah, of course it would have some impact on how I look at the world just because I spent a formative amount of my youth in it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think Brandon keeps appealing to Christian standards of morality, interestingly enough. Okay, um, I'm trying to formulate how they want to ask this. Um, let's say you have a person who doesn't really believe in God, yeah. but they act on their morals as if they did. But you have a person who believes in God, but only acts on morals because God said they should, not for the right to be right. How do you feel about those? I did address this in my uh, talk. God judges our motive. And I'm afraid our churches are filled with people that attempt to do the right thing primarily because they fear hell and hope for heaven. And if that's your ultimate motive, I'm afraid you'll end up in hell anyway. The Christian's attitude is, though he damned me, yet will I trust in him. Yet will I love him. We love him for his own sake. All right. Thank you. I actually have a, Whoa. <laughs> I actually have a curious question for both of you. Okay. Um, I'm just curious as to what your standing is on the fact that several solar messiahs predating Jesus, such as Horus from Egypt, have the exact same birth sequence and storyline as Jesus, such as um, going uh, resurrected for three days after they died, uh, resurrected three days after their birth and so on, or after their death, excuse me. Um, simply put, because I see all religious beliefs as being human constructs that people came up with to try to explain the world around them, I'm entirely unsurprised when I see a lot of crossover as beliefs get built up. Um, ideas are not birthed in a vacuum, and I think that whenever people are coming up with their take on the world, they will inherently and unavoidably look to what others have said and done. 
So as an atheist who sees all religious thoughts as being the byproduct of the human brain, when I see that crossover, I go, yep, yeah, that's exactly what I would expect to see. I would be much more amazed if there were no crossover at all. I think these uh, myths concerning Horace and so on have changed and have been adapted uh, over the years. And there are the devil's counterfeits out there. Of course, Horace uh, had uh, a falcon's head, uh, the rest uh, a man's body. He was not born in Bethlehem. He was not of the tribe of Judah. And so there are many places where uh, his storyline breaks uh, with that of Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus, the basic uh, events of his life from his birth in Bethlehem of Ju Judah was uh, prophesied by the prophets, including his, his death and resurrection. And the Jews had been dispersed throughout the whole world. They were down in Egypt for a long time. Uh, the Egyptians uh, would have learned from the uh, Jews what the Messiah was supposed to be like. So I'd just say that's a counterfeit. So if I'm to understand you, sir, your, your standing is that all other works are the work of the devil. Uh, well, all other religions are, yes, are the devil. There's a great conflict between uh, uh, God and, and Satan going on. And if you're not serving God, the scriptures teach, ultimately you're a child of the devil. Thanks, that's all I needed to know. <laughs> I noticed your shirt back there. It looks sort of... Uh, Evil. <laughs> Is there something like that? Uh, be afraid. The symbols it's scary. On sure. It's Looks scary. Sort of, uh, demonic there. Oh yeah, I like it, don't you? <laughs> but it doesn't surprise me. I'm sure it doesn't. Okay, question for both of you. Uh, I remember in the debate you said something about the social institutions, government, and all of those like kind of shaping society and being our instruction where we get moral code and how we're raising up, you know, brought up. And let me get this straight. You're fine with taking the aspect of a guy out of that, right? Um, out of the idea of debt. See, whenever I talk about social institutions in my opening uh, speech, sorry, whenever I talked about my uh, debt to institutions in my opening speech, my point is that as a secular humanist, I realized that if I didn't, let's, let's take one obvious one, schools, the institution of higher order education. I realized that I would not be the man I am today had I not had the chance to go to a college and to study and learn and apply myself. I'm not saying that you need to have college to be a good person, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I enjoy who I am right now and I realized that I wouldn't have had that possibility without higher order education. So that's one social institution that I respect. I feel a sense of debt to it. And out of admiration and a sense of debt to that institution, I, uh, I do want to embody some of those high ideals, such as tolerance of other thoughts and an open academic environment where critical thinking is encouraged and all points of view can be critically examined. So that's one case of I respect the institution, so I will try to embody its, its um, principles in my actions. So you know, if, if someone comes to me and they have a, uh, a disagreement with me, as long as they're not rude with me, I'm not going to be rude with them. If they just come up and say, hey, I think you're wrong, and I think you're going to go to hell, I don't consider that rude. I mean, if they get in my face and they start yelling it at me and they won't listen, that's kind of rude. But someone just saying, look, I disagree with you, and I think that you'll have to suffer X and Y and Z consequences if you don't change your mind, I respect that bluntness and that honesty because of what I've learned here at college about having to be blunt and honest if you're going to have good interactions with other people. So that's kind of what I was getting at there. There's no need to have God just to have respect for something that helps shape you. And I see, as an example, one institution, the school system, that helps shape me. And my respect for it is independent of whether or not there is a God or whether or not I believe in him. Okay. And, Pastor, uh, would you agree that um, with the end times or whatever, that the war that you, that you described between like being a spiritual war... Would you say that that subtleness of like taking the guy aspect out of society, out of the school, out of the institutions and everything, is that the problem that you're speaking about today or what? Well, that is a problem taking God out of one's life. 
ultimately that's a choice. We all fall into uh, people who speak to us of faith and people who speak to us of unbelief. Ultimately it's our decision, our choice, which one we're going to take. Okay, and both of you, your perspectives, like we're, we're debating today about moral standards and moral issues, but obviously there's a deeper issue that you're just not going to agree on. How effective do you think that this debate has been to get your overall message or content to everybody? It's good to get people thinking. I think we've uh, uh, both succeeded in, in doing that. And I'm convinced when a person is really thinking rationally, his thoughts will ultimately lead him to God. I believe we have two inner voices, the voice of reason. You know, God is a God of logic. He's called the Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, but the logic. And the logic was God. And the logic became flesh and dwelt among us. We all have a conscience. And when we start doing what we know we ought to do, uh, our conscience will lead us to God. But we have a way of violating and refusing to listen to our conscience. And most men aren't really governed by reason. They're governed by their emotions and their physical appetites. Like animals. They're living like animals. This is for the uh, pastor here. Uh, did you not earlier say that uh, God is pretty much made manifest throughout the entire world? That pretty much nobody should have no excuse to not know of him or something. Yeah, not know of God. Now, they have an excuse for not knowing of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying creation uh, testifies to a creator. We all know these buildings around here had an architect, right. even though we did not see him built. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take faith to believe the buildings had a builder. The mm -hmm. faith comes in and walking into the building and believing it won't uh, collapse around you. And so it is. I'm convinced it doesn't take faith to believe that God exists. God is a necessary truth. The faith is trusting in Him, relying upon Him, serving Him. That's where the faith comes in. And God is everywhere, correct? Uh, well, yes, I would say that with uh, not absolutely. God's not within the heart of the believer. He's only, or, yeah, he's not within the heart of the unbeliever. He's within the heart of the believer. But his spirit is uh, everywhere on earth. Okay. Also, uh, within the Bible, within your own beliefs, it says not to judge, correct? No, it doesn't say that. What the Bible forbids is a hypocritical judgment, uh, okay. judging hypocritically. He says, first cast the beam or the hypocrisy out of your own life. So then you can see clearly to cast the sin out of the lives of others. So Jesus, he said, uh, is basically said, do not judge or so you will be judged, correct? Well, he said in Matthew 7, verse 5, you hypocrite, first cast the beam out of your own eye. Then you can certainly cast the splinter out of your own body. We have to judge right from wrong. I'm sure well, everybody's making a judgment uh, tonight about our different arguments. Uh, you'd be foolish not to make judgments. Again, the standard is, or, or the question is, what standard do you appeal to to make your judgments? Is it just personal opinion? Is it the consensus of the community? Which is what I hear Brandon saying. I'm saying we appeal to God. And, and specifically Jesus Christ. In that case, it comes down to the fundamental question. Are you sure that you know God and know His justice? What oh, yes, wants? yes, I'm sure. I walk with sure. him and talk so to him. So you then I would judge know. everybody else as incorrect. What does that mean for you? Do not be judged. Uh, it means uh, I'm right and people who don't believe are wrong. It's very simple. And judge as you will be judged. Correct? Right. I would hope people would judge me according to the Bible, reason, and conscience. Uh, just to brand them. Yes. Like, explain something to me, like you know, it's written here, like you, for, you were a former uh, Church of Christ teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you left Christianity. Yes. Okay, great. So did you just like shut the idea of a religion, or like did you find like did you read about other religions? Uh, yeah, I read about other religions, um, and in the end, I found mostly philosophical reasons to not believe in in any religion. Uh, that's why I ultimately became an atheist. I mean, did you make sure that you know, like uh, you read about like. Uh, the whole like we have so many religions in this world, yeah. like Judaism, like all Hinduism, all of these things. Uh, so you read like uh, you I read a great deal about various different religions. I mean, I don't really think one could take the time to research every 
because uh, there's so many different religions. There's 21 major world religions, and then there's lots of other smaller ones as well. Um, and you know, there there are some that I researched more than others. I mostly looked at the bigger religions, the bigger global religions. Um, but in the end, part of the reason I became an atheist was because there were so many. Since there were so many, it seemed to me that there wasn't any single deity who was actually doing a good job of communicating what he or she or it wanted us to know. Um, but no, I, I did consider them all. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to just go, oh, well, I'm not a Christian, so I'm not anything else either. I, I thought about the other ones. So you didn't find the answer in a religion? What's that? You didn't find the answer in, like, you know, in, in a religion? I didn't find the answer, I guess, you could say I did not find the answer in religion, no. I, I found it in secular humanism. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I asked this question to Jed because I already know your standpoint on it. Um, my question is, how do you, or why do you think that regardless of the numerous scholars in or around the area of the life of Jesus, and none of their works, regardless of all of the acts the Bible portrays Jesus did, not one of them mention him, except in a few passages using only the name Christ or Christes, meaning only anointed one. How do you feel about that? Well, to, uh, well, Josephus men mentions him. He's Jewish. Therefore, he would have interest in Jesus. But really, the pagan scholars and philosophers and historians at the time, they didn't have too much interest in what was going on in little Israel, and especially amongst these people, the Jews, that they had no respect or regard for. So, so to, uh, uh, at that particular time, uh, during his life, remember Jesus did all of his preaching to Jews. He did not preach to the Gentiles. He did not confront them. I just want to say, uh, we're going to have to limit it to two more people asking questions. One for me, one for Jim. I haven't gone. I go yeah, there. someone hasn't gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've got two gone. people that haven't gone. Just, just be, it's like a little after 5.30. Okay, we I actually... We uh, some pizza, too, uh, so don't... I actually save some questions. from Brandon and I. <laughs> um, I wasn't here earlier, so if you could, uh, each of you, could you briefly um, define your definition of morality? Yeah, well, um, actually, in my beginning statement, since the topic question was, can a non-believer be consistently moral? I said in my opening statement that this was not going to be a debate about the nature, substance, and origin of morality, because that would take a lot more than just 45 minutes. I said that my impetus for being consistently moral came from, essentially, a love for others uh, was the number one cause. Then there was, uh, let's see... I'm trying to remember them all now. Love for others, a, uh, a desire to do good for its own sake, just a valuation that I, I love good for its own sake. Um, the desire to have a good life, and by good I just mean fulfilling and rewarding life, not in the superficial way, but in the kind of deep and intrinsic happiness way. And uh, the idea of debt to those positive social institutions and positive social ideas that have helped shape me into who I am today. Um, that combined with just a general sense of compassion and for others and integrity for myself was what gave me my driving impetus to be moral. Uh, as for what morality is, I think that's a, a giant debate that's fun to have but takes a lot longer than 45 minutes. Okay. Well, morality has to do uh, with right and wrong in the moral sense of the word. And Jesus Christ is ultimately the standard. I think it's interesting when he gets specific in talking about morals, the first thing he mentions is the second great commandment. Love others. Love yourself. Uh, uh, love others as you would love yourself. He didn't add that part. Uh, but, of course, he's left out the first and the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I would assume that... Uh, Brandon would admit, if there is a God, and if there is the God of the Bible, and He's not serving Him, and if He is loving, as I suggest, that uh, He's not moral. No one can be moral. My second question is actually for Brandon. Uh, oh, I think really, this guy, we only have two questions. Well, that, that was primarily because I missed everything else. Yeah, I arrived that, really that, that's okay. I'll, I'll make time. Sorry, okay. Mitchell, who's your question for? Mine's for Brother Jack. Okay. There's more pizza left for us. Okay. My, my primary question is, do you believe 
that those who believe in God and those who don't believe in God can ha have the same standard of morality when they believe that standard comes from a different source? Um, I think that essentially it is possible to settle on some things. And in my opening talk, I talked about on the positive side of you know what is moral, um, things like kindness, generosity, uh, love for others, helping others, things like that, whereas immorality would be uh, lying, cheating, stealing, harming others without decent justification to do so, uh, you know, so murder, things like that. That would be immoral. I think that believers and non-believers can obviously come to terms with and agree on those basic sorts of things. Now, if you take uh, the commandment to love God, obviously that will be one that we disagree on because of our differential opinions about the ontological nature of God. You know, that is, does he actually exist or not? Um, but when it comes to the moral basics, I believe that it is possible. Also, hi, how you been? Uh, yeah, I see uh, Brandon trying to go through the world on one leg. He's got that right, but he's got to have the other leg. If you go around just trying to you know, walk on one leg, I think you're going to be in for a great fall. We need the spirit to believe in God and uh, be really immoral. We need the spirit of Jesus Christ within us to strengthen us and keep us walking on that straight and narrow path. Hey, Jed, how you doing? Uh, my question's for you. Um, it's kind of a two-pronged question. Uh, the first part being, do you think uh, part of the unilateral morality that you suggest means following what's written in the Scriptures, following what's in the Bible? Is that part of it? Well, that's a big part of it, not all of it. Well, the second part of my question is that you've established that. How would you reconcile, I've seen your sermons before, how would you reconcile your method of preaching with what's in Corinthians 6.10? that uh, drunkards, uh, thieves, along with revilers, won't inherit the kingdom. For anybody who doesn't know, a reviler is somebody who speaks abusively to others. I've seen you call students whores and whoremongers. So according to your own doctrine, you're not going to inherit the kingdom. How, how do you reconcile that? Well, I'm, not, I, I'm warning them out of love. I'm motivated by love that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm, that's what the Bible says. Drunkards, fornicators, in those same verses, said they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And when I bring up these issues about fornication, most of them cheer and think that's great. Right. So that's not... I, I think that's revilers. People are reviling God. But not, it, it doesn't say people who are reviling no, God. It just says revilers. And a reviler is someone says, who speaks abusively towards someone else. And that's, I, I've seen you do it. I saw you do it uh, last year. Uh, they would be speaking abusively if I falsely accused them. No, that would be lying. That would be false accusation. That would be reviling. Reviling, the, dic the dictionary definition is speaking abusively towards someone. Whether what your reasoning uh, is, you know, it, it's, 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 like, it's, like, it's like the surgeon has to cut into the person, hurt them, kind of a... a Abuse that skin to open it up in order to bring healing. Again, it has to do with your motive. So the ends justify the means, then? Uh, sometimes. But that's not what it says in current. But thank you. I appreciate your response. Yep. And thus ends Q&A, everybody. I'm sure there's more pizza left. And thanks to those who are still here.